Chapter 14 Incarnation of the Soul In this chapter, Hermes reveals how souls incarnate into physical bodies. All souls share the same essential nature. They are neither male nor female, as such differentiating characteristics exist only in the body. All souls are part of the one soul of the cosmos. God has two servants which look after the souls. The keeper of souls cares for disembodied souls, and the conductor of souls sends them down into physical incarnation. Nature creates the individual body into which a soul incarnates. The power that Hermes calls memory ensures that this body conforms to the universal form of the human species. The power Hermes calls skill makes sure that each individual body is a fitting home for the particular soul it houses. Our individual characteristics are governed by the qualities of the gods presiding over the moment of our incarnation. If the gods present at our birth are peaceful, we will be peaceful by nature. If they are warlike, we will be aggressive. This is why astrologers say, for example, that those born at the time of Aries have certain characteristics, whilst those born at the time of Capricorn have a different nature. Those gods who accompany the soul at the moment of birth affect the instinctual nature of the soul. Those that have their effect later, in adolescence, affect the rational part of the soul. Before it incarnates, the soul is already wrapped in a spiritual body. When this wrapping is thin and clear, the soul is intelligent. However, when this wrapping is dense and opaque, the soul has limited vision and is only aware of its immediate situation. As a soul sinks into incarnation, it forgets its own nature and takes on the qualities of the gods who have shut it into a human body. Hermes describes a vision of disembodied souls about to make their journey into physical form. They are filled with fear and horror at the fate which awaits them. They cannot bear the prospect of such imprisonment. Incarnation of the Soul All souls are part of one soul, which is the soul of the cosmos. Souls all have one nature. They are neither male nor female. Such differences of sex arise only in the body. In the world above there are two gods, who are servants of Atom's goodness, called the Keeper of Souls and the Conductor of Souls. The Keeper is in charge of disembodied souls. The Conductor sends down these souls from time to time into physical incarnation. Nature works alongside these gods, making mortal vessels into which souls are poured. Nature also has two assistants, called memory and skill. Memory ensures that nature creates individual forms that are copies of the primal universal forms. Skill ensures that the individual frame is fashioned in conformity with the soul which will embody it. Seeing to it that lively souls have lively bodies, sluggish souls have sluggish bodies, powerful souls have powerful bodies. The soul, which is spiritual, has its own wrappings, which are also spiritual. These are coats made of air. When such coats are thin and transparent, the soul is intelligent. When they are dense and muddied, like the air in stormy weather, the soul cannot see far, but is only aware of its immediate predicament. The differences in character of the pharaohs are not determined by the nature of their soul, for all kingly souls are godlike, but by the gods, 
that escort the soul into incarnation. Souls of such quality that incarnate for so high a purpose do not descend without attendance. For divine justice knows how to assign to each his due, even when exiled from the happy land. When the soul is accompanied by warlike gods, the pharaoh will wage war. When the gods are peaceful, he will maintain peace. When they are musical, he will make music. When they are just, he will rule wisely. When they are lovers of truth, he will be a philosopher. For souls by necessity cling to the temperament of the gods who bring them down to earth. For when they sink into the human condition, they forget their own nature and are conscious only of the disposition of those who have shut them in this mortal tomb. The forces which accompany the soul do not arrive together. Some enter with the soul at the moment of birth and act on the irrational parts of the soul. The purer forces arrive at adolescence and cooperate with the rational parts of the soul. I have seen a vision of souls about to be shut up in bodies. Some of them wailed and moaned. Some struggled against their doom, like noble beasts caught by crafty hunters, dragged away from their wild home. One shrieked, and looking up and down exclaimed, O oh heaven, source of being, bright shining stars and unfailing sun and moon, light and life breath of the one, all you that share our home, how cruel it is that we are being torn away from such celestial splendor. We are to be expelled from this holy atmosphere and from this blissful life we live here to be imprisoned in a mean and sorry place. What hard necessities wait for us. What hateful thing will we have to do to meet the needs of a body that will quickly perish? Our eyes will see little only through the fluid which these orbs contain. And when we see our vast heavenly home contracted to a size as small as an eye, our sorrow will never cease. We shall not even see clearly, for we have been condemned to darkness. And when we hear our brothers and sisters blowing with the wind, we shall grieve that we are no longer breathing in unison with them.